A few months ago, um, Cliff and Amanda and I, I think it was in March, it was in the spring, I might be blocking it out because it was so stressful, Cliff and Amanda and I did a service where we committed that we were going to show you instead of tell you what it's like to be brave here in community. So for those of you who have been around a bit, you know our usual roles as your religious professionals here at River Road. You know I am usually the one who stands up here and says stuff. And Cliff, our esteemed director of music, is the one who makes all that beautiful music and causes you all to cry. That is what we do. And on that Sunday, we switched. Us in that time did something in worship that was new that was uncomfortable, that was brave for us, whether you could see the courage it took for us to do it or not. Each of us had a message that we felt cut to the heart of what matters in a community such as this one, in the community we create together. Amanda sat there and sang about a higher love that holds her even in her greatest and most searing grief. I tried in my way, to show that there are higher callings for us all, and that even for me, a calling is absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with perfect. And Cliff, Cliff was our main preacher for that day, and he brought it. He really did. He stood up here and he proclaimed the message that rests on his heart after serving you as a congregation for over 30 years, this man so prone to dad jokes and to flights of astonishing skill and musicality. He stood up here and he was a pastor to you and he asked simply this question, do you know how worthy you are of being loved? Do you know, he said, how worthy you are? Do you know, he invited us, do you know what it is to be up here and to see you all striving and struggling and trying to make a difference for yourselves and your families and the world? It is a jungle out there, he seemed to declare, and you are so worth loving while you make your way through it. It was pastoral preaching at its finest that Cliff offered us that day. And in some ways, it was perfect for Father's Day, which is why I'm glad I can steal all of his ideas and re-preach them to you right here this morning. After that service, a member of the congregation reached out and asked if perhaps that heartfelt statement Cliff shared with us was not the end, but just the beginning of a message. How do we know? This person asked, how do we know that we are worthy of being loved? If it is important to proclaim, as surely it is, it is admittedly a lot harder to live it, to know it, even for a little while, and to let that knowing sink down deep enough into our psyches that it takes up residence there and translates to a fundamental sense of worthiness in our everyday lives. Basically, if you know it, that you're worthy of being loved, how do you keep knowing it? In many ways, that is the fundamental first question that the universalist half of our religious tradition has been asking for literally thousands of years. And so it is the perfect question for us to ask together today. And one answer to that question, how do we know, is to simply say that we have a religious tradition which proclaims it which has proclaimed it at great cost over the span of generations. You are loved and you are worthy of love because, in fact, that is the whole reason we exist as a congregation and an entity, as Unitarian Universalists. We have proclaimed it not as a fact or a provable assertion, but as a central tenet of religious belief, one way we know, satisfying or not, that we are worthy is by faith faith, the faith that our forebears gave us. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, which wins the prize for most obvious sentence ever preached from this pulpit. 
And yet being a Unitarian Universalist congregation does bring with it a particular theology. Our identity as Unitarian Universalists, you may know, comes from a long line of liberal religious history and a historically evolving set of ideas about just what being religious means in this world. We Unitarian Universalists, like everybody, are the result of both nature and nurture. Personally, and as a movement, we are original enough, but we are also kind of derivative. We are our very own, and we are the product of all who went before us. The Unitarians and the Universalists are our own distinct faith parents. They are the two denominations in American Christianity that came together to make us us, not because they both had perfectly aligned beliefs, but because they both had strange enough beliefs in the eyes of everyone else that their status as outliers separated them them from the rest of the Protestant world, and they figured they might as well hang out together. Thus, we are the child of two distinct and distinctly heretical Christian traditions. And as most UU parents will attest, any offspring of two odd ducks is bound to be more than a little bit interesting in their own right. Like each of us, our movement was created from this distinct parentage, each parent shaping the next generation with their own values, their own sometimes oppositional characteristics. Personally, I got my mom's brown eyes and my dad's propensity for giving long-winded speeches. As a beloved community, we got so much from both our parent traditions too. And today, given that rich question, how do we know that we are worthy of being loved? I want to remind us of perhaps the greatest gift that our theological parent in that second you, the universalists, gave us. You see, the central doc doctrine that cuts to the core of universalism is simply that question of who is worthy, who is worthy of God's love and how that love moves in the world. As a belief system, universalism took shape within the confines of the early Christian church as a doctrine of universal salvation, the belief that all things and especially all people will eventually come into harmony with the divine. This doctrine earned our early American Universalist ancestors the nickname, the No-Hellers. And they were quite literally that. They were Christian believers who affirmed an idea that Jesus' salvation was so complete that it included everyone, whether they believed in that salvific power of Jesus or not. To our Universalist forebears, heaven was the biggest tent imaginable and everybody would end up there in the end. Our theological ancestors were people who believed that God was literally love incarnate, the bringer given shape and form and face and hands in your lives, in our lives. Our ancestors were the ones who believed God was made real in the love we show each other. And yes, they were Christians in the American Universalist tradition. Long past the turn of the 20th century, American Universalists proclaimed that God was born into the body of that man, but through that story, God gave everyone life, not just some of us, not just the nice ones, not just the ones who have it all together, not just those who believe in God, but all of us, all souls, everyone would come back to that love in the end. That is what they lived for. The universalist message taught that God's business was not to punish us, but to love us with a love that knew no bounds. And so historically, universalists knew we were worthy of being loved because our tradition taught us that we were loved by a frankly quite fatherly force whose love was so big it wouldn't let us go. And while we certainly may not believe in such a fatherly paternalistic force raining all that love down on us today, while we may not believe in a separately existing God at all, one cannot dismiss the radical theology and the power held in it of a love that holds us all, that makes room for us all, no matter what, and that makes room for all of us, not just parts of us. 
In fact, maybe in this very time, when people are trying to draw increasingly narrow circles around love, around nationality, around patriotism, around pride, maybe we never needed that expansive theology more. I was reminded of this recently by the amazingly talented pop culture icon and prophet of the ages, Billy Porter. Have any of you been following Billy Porter slaying his way across every one runway in America over the last few weeks? No? If you haven't, just like Google and hashtag goals because this man is amazing. Billy Porter is an actor. He's a Broadway actor, a television actor. And in the last few months, he has been walking his way in glorious full-scale ball gowns through every red carpet opening, showing exactly who he is with all the flamboyance and glory and grace that a human being is capable of. He shines. And Billy Porter is on a television show called Pose. It's about the ballroom culture in New York City's Greenwich Village for gay and trans folks throughout the last 30 years. And when asked about what it is that brings him home time and time again to those trans communities that show their fabulousness and their flair and their beauty and their grace, what brings him home time and time again to those communities, Billy Porter recently said, you see, Sometimes our biological families are not equipped to love us fully and unconditionally as we are. And so we find each other. When our biological families are not equipped to love us fully and unconditionally without limit and without measure, we need to point ourselves in the direction of that kind of love somehow. And so we find each other. We need to put ourselves in the direction of that love, he proclaims, often enough that we cannot forget it, often enough that we carry it with us, often enough that it lives down in our souls so we can sally forth into the world so brave that we can be all of who we are. If we cannot find unconditional love from our own people, we need to find it somewhere and build communities that can hold it, the chosen families that can create it, letting us know over and over and over again that we are worthy, that we are fabulous, that we are loved. If you don't know it, find the people who will tell you and surround yourselves with them over and over again. So many of our forebears in the universalist tradition, they lived and died in a way like Billy Porter, knowing they were loved. And being so loved, they were able to be brave. And if that is all we remember from them, the ones who came before us, if that is the only thing they gave us, and maybe that theology is all we inherit from them, it is enough. Another way we know we are worthy of love is to live as if we are and to treat others as if they are worthy to, in so doing to create exactly the world we imagine. If I could capture hundreds of years of universalist theology in just a couple of words, it would be merely that, that you are loved. And since you are loved, you are never fully alone. No matter how we have interpreted and reinterpreted that theological gift from our ancestors over the, over the years, our universalist parent teaches us you are loved, not judged, not condemned. It is our greatest gift. You are loved. And the lingering question always is this. Given the evolution of our theology, given the doubts and questions we bring through these doors with us, if we are loved and our theology teaches we are loved, if we are worthy of love and our community teaches us we are worthy of that love, whom exactly are we loved by? It is the case with so many of us that an expression of faith in a God whose name is love is simply not going to cut it. And still we need to know 
if not as a matter of faith, then as a matter of practice. As St. Billy proclaims, if you aren't feeling the inherent sense of love, of worth, if nobody, including God, seems equipped to love you unconditionally, you have to choose to show that love yourself. You have to point yourself in the right direction and choose some other people who, aren't, who are going to help you know it and help you believe it. One way we can know we are worthy of love is to, in fact, have faith. I think I have argued that our tradition is better equipped to set us up for that faith than perhaps any other. But another way we can know we are worthy of love is to live it that way. Brother Blue spent his whole life knowing the struggles of this world, the harm people cause each other, the way every white boy jumped out of the pool like frogs from a pot of boiling water except that one. Brother Blue also spent his life believing that each and every person had a gift just waiting to be revealed to him, that each and every person was so blessed and so inherently worthy that at any given moment they could be the bringer for him, that any one of us might have everything he needs. And by choosing to live that way, by choosing to look upon the rest of the world with a gaze of blessing, by choosing to look for the blessing in other people, he had this wonderful side effect of knowing himself to be well and truly blessed. So how do we know we are worthy? How do we know we are loved? Either we believe it as a matter of faith, or we choose to create it as a matter of fact, like a chosen family, like a dream of comfort and peace that falls like a blanket over our sorrows. We make it real. Every time we rise again from rest and go out looking for reasons to know we are loved.